a crane collapse. 200 foot crane smashed into an apartment building on Park Lane. I think just the weight of the crane pushing the whole building down so we couldn't open the doors to get out. A massive tower crane ripped itself from the ground in Liverpool, Merseyside on July 6, 2009. This collapse cost one life's ability to walk and damaged an entire block of flats. But the cause was not high winds or a heavy load. It was fraud. The operator, 53-year-old Ian Gillam, was hurled 50 feet from his cab, surviving the crash but suffering paraplegia, permanent paralysis from the waist down. The reason for this disaster was a structural compromise that was completely hidden from view. A single, dangerous decision was made to ignore the manufacturer's mandate on the absolute, most critical components of the entire operation. This deception, buried deep within the earth, turned a 200-ton German machine into a time bomb. This is the hidden cost of cutting corners. The crane that dominated the Liverpool skyline was a Volf 500B tower crane. For those in the industry, Wolf represents precision German engineering, renowned for strength and reliability. This particular model stood 79 meters tall, well over 259 feet, and had an operating weight estimated at close to 200 metric tons. This is a machine that demands respect simply by its sheer scale and the precision engineering required to make it safe. This machine was designed for one purpose, stability under immense stress. When working, the crane generates a colossal overturning moment, the rotational force that tries to pull the entire structure out of the ground. To counteract this, the crane relies on its own weight, and crucially, its counterweights. The Volf 500B carried eight massive counterweights, each weighing seven metric tons. These weights are essential for balance, ensuring that every lift, every swing of the jib is compensated for. These counterweights are positioned on the jib in a configuration that creates a static balance with the rest of the crane's components, but this balance is constantly challenged by the dynamic forces of lifting a load. The total countermass, nearly 56 metric tons of dense material, creates an immense leverage point on the foundation, which requires an equal and opposite reaction force from the ground to prevent the crane from tipping. However, all of that power and stability is secondary to the foundation beneath it. The tower mast is anchored into deep concrete piles. The integrity of these piles is absolute, and their strength is provided not just by the concrete mass, but by an internal skeleton of steel known as rebar, reinforcement bars. These steel bars are engineered to absorb the tensile stress, the pulling force that the tower crane constantly exerts. Concrete is excellent at handling compression, but it is notoriously weak under tension, which is exactly why the steel rebar cage is fundamental. It takes on the massive tensile loads generated by the crane's overturning moment. Without the proper rebar, the concrete foundation is simply a brittle mass, unable to resist the rotational forces of a 200-ton crane. The foundation essentially acts as a colossal moment connection. And if the integrity of that connection is compromised, the entire system fails instantly. If the structure is perfect and the engineering is sound, how does a structure designed to stand for years suddenly tear itself from the ground in a matter of seconds? The fatal error was not a failure of the steel in the air, but the failure of the steel that should have been in the earth. This failure points to a deeper human choice, a compromise made in the absolute most critical yet unseen phase of the entire operation. The official investigation into the collapse at King's Dock revealed the quiet, shocking truth that led to the collapse at 9.50 a.m. that day. The foundation piles were structurally deficient, not due to an error in calculation, but due to a deliberate, criminal act of cost-cutting. The project schedule was tight, and certain parties made the decision to save both time and money by expediting the concrete pour. To do this, construction managers ordered the removal of the specified steel reinforcement bars from the foundation piles. This substitution was not just a cost-cutting measure, it was a fundamental act of fraud, compromising the structure's most critical safety element. The steel reinforcement was the entire reason the concrete was strong enough to support the crane. The rebar is engineered to withstand the tensile load, the pulling force generated by the crane's counterweights and lifted loads. 
By removing the steel reinforcement, the Foundation's capacity to handle the stress was decimated. Imagine trying to bend a thick cable versus trying to bend a brittle wooden plank. The steel cable provides the tensile strength. The concrete was left brittle, relying solely on its compressive strength, which is irrelevant when the crane attempts to rotate and tear the base apart. The factor of safety, a non-negotiable principle in heavy engineering, was effectively reduced to zero by this single act of criminal negligence. On the day of the collapse, the machine was operating in normal conditions. The load being lifted was within limits, but the cumulative stress from weeks of lifting, combined with the inherent rotational forces of the operation, was simply too much for the hollow, unsupported concrete base. The moment of failure was terrifyingly fast. The compromised foundation piles fractured and crumbled beneath the crane's weight. The tower mast instantly lost its support, and the entire Volf 500B began its catastrophic, unstoppable collapse. The operator, Ian Gillum, was in the cab. The collapse generated immense, uncontrolled momentum, and as the cab swung and broke away, he was hurled approximately 50 feet to the ground. The machine, now uncontrolled, unleashed its payload of danger. The eight seven-ton counterweights, 56 metric tons of solid concrete and steel, smashed through the roof of the nearby Chandler's Wharf apartment building, continuing through six floors. This demonstrates the incredible potential energy stored in a machine of this size. Miraculously, no residents were inside the path of the falling weights. The foundation was the single point of failure compromised by a managerial decision that prioritized profit over physics. How many other corners are cut on sites across the world, betting lives against a deadline? The Liverpool crane collapse was an unmitigated disaster, both physically and financially. While there were no fatalities, the catastrophic injury to Ian Gillam, paralyzed from the waist down, represented an immeasurable human cost. The investigation highlighted that this failure was entirely preventable, and the subsequent legal and financial fallout served as a brutal lesson on the true price of negligence. The financial fallout for the companies involved, the main contractor, Boomer and Kirkland, and the engineers, Bingham Davis, was staggering, easily approaching three million pounds once all costs are accounted for. This figure doesn't even fully capture the non-monetary costs such as the severe reputational damage to major firms in the industry. First, the direct penalty and legal costs. The main contractor, Bomer and Kirkland, was ultimately fined a substantial amount of 280,000 pounds. This penalty was imposed under health and safety legislation, reflecting the severity of the structural compromise. The engineering firm, Bingham Davis, was fined a smaller amount of 1,000 pounds, but later went bankrupt. The ultimate financial consequence of reputational damage, civil litigation, and crushing legal fees. Second, the cost of the structural damage. The 56 metric tons of counterweights that tore through the Chandler's Wharf apartments required extensive structural repair, restoration, and resident displacement. The complexity of repairing a partially collapsed, occupied residential structure pushed this cost well into the hundreds of thousands of pounds. The sheer logistical nightmare of clearing the destroyed crane and securing the damaged residential building compounded the expense. Third, the destruction of the asset and project delays. The Volt 500B was a total loss, requiring costly, specialized salvage and replacement. This loss alone represents a massive, immediate eight-figure write-off. The subsequent investigation and site shutdown resulted in crippling project delays impacting the multi-million pound development for months. For every day the site lay dormant during the investigation, financing costs and potential revenue were lost, demonstrating a critical industrial tension between safety and schedule. Finally, the immense compensatory cost. This is where the price of the negligence becomes brutally clear. In a 2013 civil settlement, the injured operator, Ian Gillum, received a substantial lump sum of 2.7 million pounds, plus an annual payment of 180,000 pounds for the rest of his life. This multi-million pound compensation paid out to cover the extensive lifetime care, specialist equipment, loss of earnings, and psychological trauma for one man 
is the single clearest measure of the collapse's financial devastation. The structured annual payment reflects the long-term commitment required to care for a victim of such catastrophic, permanent injury. The decision to cut corners on the foundation to save a small amount of money resulted in a cost of multiple millions and the complete destruction of one man's life. The core lesson from the Liverpool collapse is that technical competence is worthless without ethical integrity. The investigation unequivocally proved that the failure was a consequence of a deliberate and illegal removal of specified steel reinforcement from the foundation piles, a serious breach of health and safety law that compromised the fundamental safety of the entire site. This lack of integrity in a critical, hidden phase of construction exposed a dangerous vulnerability across the industry. The incident forced a massive, industry-wide re-evaluation of quality control for hidden components. Site managers and developers across the United Kingdom tightened procedures for verifying materials. New protocols emphasized third-party inspections and photographic evidence of rebar installation before any concrete is poured. This was a direct response to the Liverpool failure, closing the loophole that allowed structural integrity to be compromised underground. The collapse remains a textbook case in crane safety training and a stark reminder of why every specified component matters. The profound personal cost borne by Ian Gillam served as the most sobering reminder of all. His paraplegia is a permanent, physical manifestation of the industry's failure to uphold its most basic safety promises. He paid the ultimate price for a managerial decision to save a tiny fraction of the project budget. We began by stating that the collapse was caused by a decision hidden in the ground. The final, inescapable truth is that the integrity of a structure is only as strong as the integrity of the people who build it. And for Ian Gillam, that integrity was found wanting. The Liverpool crane collapse was a devastating case study that showed the true cost of cutting corners on safety. The deliberate removal of steel reinforcement led to the destruction of a 200-ton crane and a financial loss exceeding 3 million pounds. Most importantly, it led to the paralysis of operator Ian Gillam, a permanent reminder written in one man's life. Thanks for watching Hard Hat Industries, your source for serious machines doing real work. If you like this, hit like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss what's next. Until then, Keep your head down and your gear running.